was an all-rounder. Um, I think probably the only rivals Sterl has ever had as an all-rounder were probably Mario and Jackie X. As far as I'm concerned, Sterl, Sterling is the best driver who ever lived. Uh, but while Fangio was racing um, at that time, I think, you know, in Formula One terms, you would say, every, anybody would say, well, he, he, to the day he retired, he was the best. Um, but certainly, in, even when they, the year they were together at Mercedes in 1955, um, in sports car races, Sterling was definitely quicker than Fangio in, in the 300 SLR. But what he always said was, yes, yes, but in the Formula One Mercedes, you know, Fangio was Fangio. Um, but I think once Fangio had retired, um, Sterling moved into that position in the sense of there, there never any of his contemporaries would, would never disagree for a second, even at the time. No, no, he's, he's just better than we are, and that's the end of it. Where, where do you sit on Aintree 55 and, and Sterling winning that race from Fangio? Well, I have always, I, I mean, I'm not putting Sterling down for one second, I never would, and I'm certainly not that day. But um, it's always struck me as probably a bit more than coincidental that it was the British Grand Prix. Uh, Mercedes fundamentally were in racing to sell cars. Our cameras went to entry for the British Grand Prix, organised by the Daily Telegraph and attended by the largest crowd ever seen at a motor race in this country. Sterling Moss was driving one of the Mercedes under the eagle eye of the German team manager, Neubauer. Now, last minute instructions for Mike Hawthorne in the Ferrari team, while the crowd wait tensely for the start. Off they go on the first of 90 laps around this three mile circuit. And as everybody expected, the Mercedes were setting a heat wave pace. Fangio, number 10, was out in front with Moss right on his tail. The British ace took over from Fangio after 26 laps. Driving magnificently, he held the lead to finish at an average of 86.47 miles an hour, just ahead of the world champion. A wreath of laurels from Mrs. Topham to Sterling Moss, who has realised his ambition by becoming the first Briton to win the British Grand Prix. And it was immensely popular in this country, as you can imagine. It was his first Grand Prix win, and uh, uh, it, it was, without any doubt, it was the result the crowd wanted to see that day. And uh, um, so I don't for one second think Neubauer said to Fangio, let him win. But I think Fangio himself probably didn't push as, you know, maybe as, as, as hard as he could have done. Because the only other thing that's, that's always struck in my mind is that the year before that, in 54, before Sterling joined the, joined the Mercedes team, Fangio's teammates that year were Carl Kling, who did every race, and Hans Hermann, who occasionally was, was in a third car. And there was a non-championship race, uh, I think in the September or October of 54, uh, at Arvis, of all places. Um, and there, Kling won the race, and Fangio was second. And again, you sort of think, well, from a PR aspect as well, you know, it was a race in Germany, and, uh, um, and Kling won it. And, you know, I mean, on talent, in a hundred years, Kling would never have beaten Fangio in a straight race. So I'm not saying, as I say, I'm not saying Sterling was allowed to win at Aintree. Um, and certainly I don't believe there was any sort of order from Neubauer, but I think I've always kind of thought probably Fangio thought, yeah, yeah. Um, then with Maserati, of course, I mean, he won loads of races in the 300S, uh, which is one of my favorite, favorite cars. Um, and then later on the birdcage, which I also adored, like you. Um, and I suppose the most famous win in the birdcage was with the, the, another Nurburgring 1000 Ks with, uh, with Gurney in, uh, what was that, 60? Yeah. And the famous picture of him, I don't know, I don't know. I can't, because of the fog, it's difficult to tell exactly where on the circuit he was. Um, but this white car looming through thick, thick fog. And the conditions that day, everybody talks about, you know, Jackie Stewart's famous win in 68 in the Grand Prix, and it was 
a fabled win, of course it was, in appalling conditions. But looking at photographs of the thousand Ks that day, it was at least as bad. And, and the fog, you just think, how on earth, you know, was it countenance they could go racing when they couldn't really see anything? And he did always say also um, that uh, looking back on it, the team, the sports car teammate he most respected probably was, was Gurney, which is quite something because that was relatively early in, in Gurney's, you know, European career. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I remember I wrote a piece for, uh, for Motorsport and I was uh, um, mainly it was it was a gurney piece, but we got that day we uh, we we got into um, uh, you know well who was the best who was the best you ever raced against, um, and of course Dan being Dan you know the gentleman he was he just sort of said well you see the problem with this is if you make a choice then you offend somebody and I really don't want to fall out with anybody or I don't want to fall out with the fans of you know. So I said, yeah, yeah, all right, well, fine, you know. And, and it took forever to get an answer out of him. But it was interesting because, I mean, he had raced, well, he, Dan had raced against everybody. Uh, but in Dan's head, it was a straight, it was, there were only two names on it. It was either Sterling or Jimmy. Um, and I thought, we're never, ever going to get an answer to this. <laughs> I've been on the phone for God knows how long. He was going round in circles, well, you know, you know. But then again, Sterling was fantastic. You know, Jimmy, but on the other hand, Jimmy could do that. I said, yes. And in the end, it, I mean, it, it, it kind of broke his heart to make a choice, but he just said, ah, okay, yeah, well, have I got to pick one? Uh, by an inch, it will be Jimmy. Really? That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but uh, I, you know, the thing about it was, there were only those two. Now, you think of everybody he raced against, yeah, in the States and elsewhere, those were the only two names that really were worthy of consideration for that. It's an interesting one. When you look at Jimmy and, and Sterling and the time they spent, not much time at all racing one another, most days Sterling had the advantage over Jimmy. Towards the end of the Springbok Series 61, obviously Jimmy had the the, the 21, the new 21, Sterling was still in the 1821, so it wasn't really fair. But prior to that, admittedly very early days, still in Jimmy's career, Sterling seemed to be, seemed to have the edge. And I think Jimmy, Jimmy always conceded that, did he not? I think he did, but I, I remember, and I did talk to Sterling about that, and he, and he said, um, yeah, to the, I think to probably to my last race, um, in equal cars, I could beat him. But he said, but I did, I did see, not the writing on the wall, but I did see what was happening coming up on the horizon. Uh, and he said, it was certainly very clear to me all by then already, you absolutely did not want to race against Jimmy with a, with a car advantage. Because he said, because even then, you know, he was, he, he was one of those people instantly, you knew, well, this, this, this guy's special. Mm -hmm.